So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, NDA and KPMG's joint seminar today on evolution of white collar crimes and investigations. Uh, happy to welcome you here this afternoon. My name is Sahil Kanuka. I co-head the International Dispute Resolution and Investigations Practice at the firm of Nishid Desai Associates. We have a very distinguished panel here with us today who is going to discuss this uh, topic with us. So without further ado, I'll start introducing our panel. We have Mr. Ashok Nambesan, who is the EVP and General Counsel at Culver Max Entertainment. Uh, Ashok has been an integral part of the core management team at the company since about the last decade. He comes with tremendous experience of over 30 years in corporate law and in his current role as EVP and General Counsel, he is responsible for overseeing the corporate relations, uh, legal and regulatory affairs, as well as the standards and practices of the company's business in India and abroad. Interestingly, uh, his entity is the subsidiary of a US-based entity, so he's very well, well versed in cross-border matters and these kind of concerns. Don't, don't believe all that he says. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we now have Stanhaya Ghosh, who is the Director of Legal and Compliance at Medtronic. Uh, she's currently leading the Legal Secretarial and Compliance function at Medtronic, which is a subsidiary of Medtronic PLC, a global leader, again cross-border oriented company. She oversees the legal and compliance work of the India as well as the frontier markets comprising of India, India, Indonesia, Philippines, Sri Lanka and a few more countries. So probably a Southeast Asian uh, facing role but again global facing in a certain way. We then have Jagvinder Brar who is the head of department of forensic services at KPMG India. He's a partner, he heads the practice uh, for the KPMG EMA region. He is a forensic accountant as well as an investigator with over 24 years of experience. Uh, he spent about 20 years with KPMG in Canada and India and over four years with the Integrity Vice Presidency at the World Bank Group in Washington DC. Rich experience. And last but certainly not the least, Vyapak Desai, who is the head of the International Dispute Resolution and Investigations Practice at NDA. Uh, Vyapak needs no introduction to this particular group, but he has over 20 years of experience in this particular practice area. In addition to being uh, a dispute resolution and an investigations lawyer, Vyapak has the uh, interesting uh, role of having practiced capital markets in his earlier avatar also at the firm. So he brings together a, a, a very handy mix of corporate as well as non-corporate related work. Now with that introduction, let's get this, let's kick the ball and let's start off by asking the most basic question which we're going to start off with today and I'm going to ask all the panelists this. So each of them is going to give their two bits on this. In your respective roles, uh, what kind of white collar crime do you see these days being encountered by private organizations? Uh, what I'll do is I'll start off with Vyapak and then we'll move on to other people on the panel. Yeah, so I think thanks Sahil for the introduction and kicking off this session. I think uh, white collar crimes uh, is not a new subject, right? I think we have seen this uh, evolving over a period of time in India. Uh, it was always there, I think, in some form or the other, but uh, I feel uh, it started making more sense to a lot of companies and industries and management particularly uh, post the Satyam Saga, right? I think that's where, in a way, it was a uh, starting point of making a lot of things uh, formal uh, as far as the uh, company related frauds and company related white collar crimes and so on and so forth. In fact, if you see 2013 Companies Act, I think section to section you can feel the overshadowing Satyam as a uh, you know case study and every section you will see that okay they have brought in to plug in some loophole here, they have tried to plug in some loophole there. For the first time maybe, I don't know if someone has an other experience but I have never seen a statute like Companies Act defining fraud in any other <laughs> jurisdiction right fraud is a general subject right but uh, for the first time 
India adopted a definition of fraud under the Companies Act. And that's how it gave a lot of teeth uh, to other regulators, including the SFIO, the SEBI, the RBI, uh, to look into a lot of those affairs. And then came the onslaught of uh, nobody knew what this whole enforcement directorate is all about. And then suddenly they saw, okay, this is a good sleeping tiger. Uh, let's wake uh, that, that up. And the pandemic. So I think uh, it has evolved in last 2009. I, I remember Jan 7, 2009 was the letter written by Ramalinga Raju. And it evoked uh, a great response in terms of how regulators dealt with it. And now we are in 2023 Jan. So I think about you know 15 years but it has evolved from what it was which was all internal to what it is now external on day one right uh, whether we have seen cases like satyam to cases like bharat pay to cases like uh, many others in the recent times uh, i think it's no longer that you can keep it inside the companies right so i think that's the evolution i have seen i don't want to go into examples but i let others to chip in. Thank you, Vyapak. And with that, let's jump a little bit into industry. And Tanaya, your thoughts on this? So I think, yes, uh, white collar crimes have always been there, but because of the way the statutes have been evolving, I think the onus on companies to investigate them properly, to make necessary disclosures, I think that has seen a sea change. But I think broadly, I think if we look at things have been going on we only see a surge and the nature of the crimes actually which is changing mm -hmm. so you know we, we we must have started out with something very basic but over the course of the years we are realizing the the way the misappropriation of funds or assets happen the amount of layering i think it's getting sophisticated by the day and it's very easy uh, it's not easy at all it's rather very difficult to you know peel all those layers and then uh, you know get to that conclusion where you are sure okay this has actually happened ashok you know for me my perspective on this uh, side is that you know what we have seen you know and over the last so many years initially you know we had these whistleblower mechanisms it's not that it's something new it's been there for a long time but uh, there used to be a hesitancy about uh, people making complaints <clears throat> but what we now see is that uh, Maybe it's the you know, people be becoming more aware of uh, what's happening. Maybe it's also a factor of improved level of governance uh, and more awareness of what white collar crimes are. But uh, we've seen that a lot of these uh, complaints are now coming in through the uh, whistleblower sy system. And uh, in you know in in, in, in several cases, it turns out uh, that uh, these complaints are founded in some something that has happened. And coming to see media and entertainment, you know, we de deal in intangibles, and valuing intangibles is not an easy proposition. You, know, you could buy one movie for a certain number of crores, you could buy another movie for a, uh, you know, for a different. So these uh, negotiations are very. It's not like buying a, you know, buying a tool set or buying something where you can apply a value. So these are the <coughs> when things can come up, and that's when you get uh, these kind of complaints about something happening. So I am seeing a trend now of uh, enhanced uh, reporting and a trend of uh, people now wanting to see if you walk the talk and you talk about governance and you talk about code of conduct and all that, not only within the company, I am I'm looking, seeing it from outside, holding you up to that kind of standard. I think that's becoming much more relevant these days. Thank you. And uh, to round up this question, Jag, your thoughts on this? Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sahil. So I echo the thoughts, you know, of uh, my co-panelists. I think if I were to take a little bit more uh, broader view, right? I mean, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, wherever we go, I get hit by fraud, you know, in many ways. So if I were to look at, for example, the uh, financial service sector, right? There are some very unique trends that you see in FS sector. So if you slice it by sector, right? so like money laundering, for example, is a big element or type of white collar crime that is coming there. Uh, you know, crypto exchanges have their own challenges that they are de dealing, whether they are conduits of fraud 
or whether they are you know uh, an enablers of fraud or victims of fraud of course all of that you know we can do on the side uh, payment banks have their own issues so within the financial service sector insurance has its own not only now but the you know the issues of arson or issues of false claims inflated claims you know and the trend that we have seen is they are they have become humongous now where a claim used to be maybe you know 10 20 crore these days I, we see claims that are 1200 crores 1500 crores of the insurance claims lost lost by fire but is that genuine claim or is it you know uh, maybe not genuine claim so so i think that is on that if we take like medical life science industry we are seeing different trends i mean i think the allegations of what happened in guyana you know mm. by a, a company now be that as it may it's a poor sort of gmp there a good medical practice maybe it's not there but it is also said that that is driven by the greed of that you know so they have their own thing consumer market has its own share of, of frauds e-commerce i think has another set of frauds that we are seeing so if one were to dissect you know there are some specific and unique frauds that are happening and if I were to go maybe step back and look at the overall industry, you know, what, what we have seen is that I think uh, in 2010 to 2018, most of the cases that we did pertain to, let's say, anti-bribery and corruption kind of issues. But now we are seeing re-emergence of the traditional fraud. Now, this is pure play, financial, greed-driven, uh, motivated frauds, maybe by the promoters, maybe by the middle level employees uh, you know but mostly driven by the financial motive uh, again financial reporting frauds are again emerging there was a good phase of I think many years when you know we didn't hear as many financial frauds but we are hearing and we are actually investigating a lot, lot more. more of that uh, supply chain is another big area in any kind of industry like mostly where the spend of raw materials and you know the conversion manufacturing is very high uh, where the uh, i think the the individual greed of the supply chain department people has exceeded all proportions in my sort of you know 20 plus years Inventory of experience management. yeah so so i think you know one has to really look at the depth and breadth and you know the frauds are humongous uh, that you know in even if i were to look at the last three years data i think the quantum of the loss to organization has uh, gone significantly up compared to let's say what it was earlier right? so so that's how i would want to summarize thank you yeah. and i think while i am with you I'll, I'll ask you one more follow-up question i know you've touched upon it a little bit when you've spoken about how the numbers have increased drastically over the years but is there any other particular trend that you see when you observe white collar crime uh, today as it stands today versus how it was or how the situation was even five or maybe ten years ago it could be not just from a perspective of existence of the crime but also how uh, today's companies are uh, looking at that particular yeah. incident yeah so i mean beyond uh, you know the trend of bribery corruption versus financial fraud and beyond the fact that you know the quantum has become much bigger i think the other thing i can uh, <coughs> uh, look at is uh, you know, in terms of the uh, detection techniques or the uh, the perpetration ways, so it is a lot more computer driven. It is a lot more technology, technology driven. So I think the the role of technology has become big, which actually makes it also more difficult to mm. to detect it. And by the time you know it is detected, I think the the losses are already higher because of whether it is the volume or the long period. Uh, you know of the obfuscation you know that happens so I think the the tech has another big role to play uh, I, I think the related party transactions which were always there I'm not saying that the related parties were not there earlier but now we see little bit more convoluted related parties which are not only restricted to you know like the round tripping that used to happen let's say within the in Indian entities uh, accommodation entries being given by let's say the accommodation entry operators in Calcutta falls for the bills you know that that were taken now actually they have assumed a more international and global uh, 
uh, you know color so you, we typically see transactions that are you know export or import transactions which are for the purpose of round tripping and i think that is where <coughs> you know the of course we will talk about third party risk management and all that but it may be unbeknownst to the uh, you know the senior people within the organization that even these transactions are happening by some people who are conflicted right so so i'll just uh, maybe add a couple of those major observations that we have so can i i i think just it's interesting <clears throat> the question that you raised because you know today with so much technology to hand uh, there is convenience so for most of us speed and convenience matter right? so you tend to your dependence on technology is that much more so the flip side to that is that dependence on technology also encourages for example our transaction banks what will happen uh, uh, online hmm. and you know the bank takes a long indemnification from you saying that any instruction you give something but the more you get into this uh, convenience driven uh, uh, ecosystem hmm. it is bound to have the question is the balance you know i mean as uh, well, uh, he was saying that you know the scale of uh, these frauds has, has risen but you know we were a uh, maybe a 500 um, billion economy we are now a 5 trillion or 3 trillion economy going to 5 trillion the scale is going to in, in, you know in, increase whichever way you look at it and the more you rely on technology it has its downsides i think the question is whether you can build enough guardrails to try to stop some of this from happening early enough yeah. thank you that's a good that's a good thought also uh, just a small uh, anecdote right on this like i as he was saying earlier also this was there but because of technology and the greed i think things have changed just as a small anecdote i just remember like i'm sure most of us have lived in small towns earlier and these things were always there but i remember uh, you know uh, several several years ago there will be always suddenly some shop coming up in a area which will say you just pay 50% of the amount and you get something after 20 days or something like that everybody knows that one day this will evaporate Most. right everybody okay. knew about it today uh the same level of uh, you know s- uh, scheme of frauds and all the scale has gone so high recently we were doing one large investigation uh, it's a simple thing right you invest in crypto or you invest in something 20% 30% first month you get return second month you get return from third month you stop getting returns by the time the amounts have gone into crypto and then it has gone to some other account and then outside india and then there is no traceability right right so i think to some extent everybody knows what's happening uh, it's just that whether i will be party to the fraud or whether i will benefit out of it that whole thing about greed uh, and the technology has changed the perspective so the ponzi schemes are now like bitcoin ponzi schemes yeah. and so they have <laughs> taken the shape of earlier we we used to hear people investing 500 or yeah, 2000 or 3000 schemes, yeah. mlms now they are investing through the bitcoins correct and tanaya your thoughts on <laughs> this so i think yeah well, i agree and echo with what all of my panelists are saying i think anything just about with anything everything has its flip side so technology i think we have survived the pandemic because of the technology uh, there's an acknowledgement for that the way we have been able to kind of manage some of these things is purely because of the technology but yes what technology does is ease and that makes it manifold so something which was probably contained to one shop one city now can be a global phenomena and just because it's a global phenomenon it's just very very difficult to crack so i think the the size and the scale is clearly changing but even if we look at from corporations perspective i think the surge that we see is because of technology again a lot of the cyber crimes we didn't knew this 10 years back but now it's very very evident the statute expects us we have now these cert guidelines they impose on us something which is just not humanly possible reporting something which is not even actually impact having any adverse impact so i think those things are really changing sexual harassment again a big thing i've seen over the course of the last 5 7 years things have really gone for a change it's very very different and corporations are also taking them very seriously i have in the past seen some of these things been 
shoved under the carpet because it involved a very very powerful senior leadership team mm. member so i think those things are changing i think greed i completely agree with jack i think there is no definition of where greed is leading us um, i come from a life care healthcare sector so um, i don't know but how many of you will be able to relate to but the theranos scandal yeah. at the peak of her thing uh, that entity was valued at 10 billion dollars just on the basis of faking it till you make it there was no real substance and people were <coughs> eager to fund such startups and without really getting into what uh, they were really doing and what translated into so i think um, the pace at which we want to grow there are corporations which probably have 150 years 70 years legacy and we see enterprises overnight transforming and becoming unicorns i think greed has a big role to play in those things and that is really impacting manipulation of sales manipulations of uh, accounting records i think always been there but i think the level at which it is being done and the sophistication with which it is being done it is seeing a sea change we really are coming across things that are well thought out designed some of the things that are in the public domain and we can talk openly is the nike case that resonates with me good company has excellent internal controls and yet someone was able to manipulate the system for years together clear conflict of interest you give the work consistently year on year to a friend of yours you create an alter ego you do wire frauds means there is just so much to be there and it went on right in spite of internal controls being there statutory auditors being there and some compliance framework and everything being there so i think it it just dawns on us as we keep on really looking into things objectively uh on a day to day basis because uh people are very creative people are smart enough to really change the game yeah. and you just do a catch up situation i think on most occasions yeah. well i'll share i think two two things you know there so in one of the cases we were investigating now see earlier what used to happen some kind of improper payment or benefit be it in whichever way gold coins or whatever you know used to move from let's say you know the giver to the taker right and maybe someone can intercept that okay you know and then evidence can be found now these days are you know totally sort of you know different way so in one of the cases we find how the benefit was being given is through the information so for example a supplier is a listed entity the you know the customers people whoever is the decision maker procurement or otherwise they will hold certain shares of the supplier because it's a perfectly legitimate activity right i mean for anyone to hold shares of a listed entity now they will pass on certain information ki ye quarter bura hone wala hai ye quarter acha hone wala hai right so accordingly you take short positions or you take long positions now what has flown from the you know from the supplier to the you know beneficiary is totally something which cannot be you know i mean it it would be a phone call so there is no trace of that there is no message there is no email there is nothing that can form as a firm conclusive evidence and therefore but the benefit has been given right because now that sort of rise or decrease in shares or put options and all that can be a huge it can be much more than any other thing and it is also not a loss to the giver because you know the 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 uh, supplier has not lost anything right because whatever has happened is is it through the insider trading scheme by passing there so so i think that is one sophisticated scheme we have come across recently the other one is where it is i think little bit more traditional is rather than you know giving uh, things of value otherwise you know like cash or other things we are seeing uh, benefits like you know renovation of a house right so some uh, beneficiary has an apartment you know the whoever has to give the you know uh, bribe or kickback they will do renovation of that house 
now it is very difficult you know not only the expense but even uh, everything is legal for this giver for tax purposes right the bills are genuine the only thing is consignment address is different so they can easily write off as repairs maintenance of their own factories and other buildings while the material may have actually gone to the the beneficiary who is of course in the form of kickback and all that so i think those are the ones where the detection is becoming more difficult no matter with how much data analytics and other technology you use some of these things will be very difficult to detect so thank you everyone yes. so what we have now seen is that over the last 5 to 10 years uh, the concept of fraud and white collar crime has changed a lot uh, there's a lot of sophistication in the system people gaming the system have started doing so in a completely different way and in ways that are harder and harder to trace it's not impossible to trace but it's harder to trace uh, there is a significant evolution in the way people are thinking this through is obviously very well thought out uh, utilization of technology slippery slope it certainly got us past the pandemic but it's certainly the gateway to a lot more fraud so uh, good bad you be the judge of that uh, and the starting point of fraud being greed obviously there's a lot more greed in the system and where people are willing to draw the line has obviously also changed over the years now with that thought let's move into the next phase which is that where fraud is detected in a company by the officers by the employees management anyone within a company what is the legal framework which can be used to take legal action and for that i'll ask vyapak to jump in yeah sure no i think uh, while we use different words about the fraud at the end of the day there are very basic provisions of indian penal code which apply in most of the situation right i think the most classic one is the cheating uh, which we all know uh, section 420 uh, i think it can apply in possibly every situation of fraud that uh, one may think of the other one particularly in a corporate uh, white collar crime situation is criminal breach of trust because that also brings in its own element of uh so section 405 gives pretty good handle on even if you are not able to prove the intention to cheat because it's a very high threshold even 420 why it's very commonly used but criminal breach of trust is a very uh commonly used section which can bring in a lot of this uh provisions uh, or lot of this factual matters under the ipc and uh, i think the third one which uh people bring in to uh, get little more handle on what's happening uh, is also forgery right because uh, there will be always an element of forgery when there is an element of fraud uh, if somebody would have signed some document created some document we have seen invoicing invoices getting created sent on gmail sign signatures being taken or for done some forgery on that so i think Uh, broadly uh, you will see cheating uh, criminal breach of trust and forgery uh, the other sections which have now become even more relevant from a corporate law perspective as i was saying is the definition of fraud under the companies act itself right because that allows you to then trigger the sfio uh, investigation that triggers the other reporting requirements under your mca or to the government and there are criminal procedures without going into ipc because the thresholds are obviously different uh, from a corporate level fraud versus a criminal fraud because criminal fraud at the end of the day under ipc you will have to still go under cheating here you have certain criminal actions but you are prosecuting under the companies act so i think we have seen more and more use of so called civil statutes uh, for the purpose of uh, you know looking at uh, enforce me the uh, the factual data against any people under those uh, statutes from a regulatory perspective i think 
we have spoken about it but uh, i think pmla has became becoming more and more st- stronger and day by day getting more and more traction particularly after the supreme court judgment recently uh, upholding a lot of sections under pmla which are otherwise not considered as points of natural justice from a defense perspective right you don't have to you know uh, follow a lot of criminal procedure code otherwise required to follow under other sections without going into the nuances of it but pmla gives much wider uh, powers to the prosecution and less of natural justice points to the defense compared to any other criminal uh, procedure code and that was the in a in a layman terms that was the basic problem which was challenged before the supreme court of india uh, of course there are nuances to it there are details to it but that's broadly the difference and uh, i think that has become uh, more and more relevant and the third uh, angle to this whole thing particularly in a bribery uh, or a kickback situation is still unlike other countries particularly like uk we don't have still private to private kickbacks or bribery as part of any violation it's still only if it is related to any public body but what prevention of corruption act did in 2018 is that earlier it was only the bribe taker who was directly prosecuted a uh, bribe giver was only an abettor in that sense so the level of prosecution was very different but why we have not gone to the level of private to private kickbacks and bribes but at least if we, even if it is a private to public sector bribe or kickbacks or whatever then now bribe giver is equally responsible and directly prosecuted under the prevention of corruption so that has now become even more difficult for a corporations to avoid not investigating into things because corporations and their employees are directly prosecuted under prevention of corruption act earlier it was like somebody asked it whoever took the bribe will be facing the prosecution i only are i am only an abettor so i am much in the queue i am well behind uh, the whole prosecution uh, but now bribe giver is equally responsible and prosecuted so i think again uh, we can discuss this at length but i think the length and breadth of the law which was only limited to cheating and criminal breach of trust i think has gone much wider uh, in the recent times you know uh, thank you for that vyapak i think vyapak's given a very good uh, description of what the the ground realities are for prosecuting uh, a case of fraud or corruption or bribery uh, atanay has some inputs on this your thoughts yeah so i think you know i would like to bring in a different facet to it as multinationals working in india say we have an allegation it's substantiated we know a fraud has been committed do we really take it beyond an internal investigation first the challenge of working with uh, agencies like police the long delay how civil and criminal uh, cases uh, roll out but the most important part is also the fact that we are because we are a subsidiary of a us or a european company the obligation to report in those jurisdictions where our parent companies reside i think that is a big <coughs> kind of a blocker somewhere for us to say is do we take it beyond an an internal investigation do we really go out and explore what legal remedies are available to us because we might not have an obligation to disclose but our parent company may have an obligation to disclose under laws like ukb and fcpa so i think that is also something that we always kind of keep on debating is where we draw the line what is the scope and till when we do the fact finding we limit it to fact finding or we do explore possibilities of a legal remedy so thank you for that and i think with that what we understand is that when you are at fact finding stage it's important not to lose sight of the end goal which is at some point this may end up before uh, a court or in civil or criminal proceedings 
So keeping that thought in mind, uh, you have to develop your strategy for your investigation, keeping that particular end game. So what are the key factors in determining this kind of strategy? Something we're going to talk about next. Uh, Ashok, do you, would you like to jump in with your thoughts on this kind of a approach? I just wanted to talk a little bit about what Tanaya said about the MNCs and uh, you know we have this FCPA. It's a very strange uh, law which only I think the US can devise such laws which have <laughs> extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction. So in theory uh, you can be an Indian citizen working for an Indian company which is uh, a subsidiary of a US company and something can happen here in terms of an allegation of bribery which may get resolved in India and say nothing has happened. But uh, you go to US, you could in theory be arrested for that, uh, for that offense. I think that's the severity of this, uh, of this uh, FCPA law. But the flip side of it is also that uh, if you are a good corporate citizen in the sense that you, if you have an anti-bribery policy and if you have training and if you can demonstrate the things that you do to ensure a higher level of compliance, that actually gets you some brownie points. So that's the interesting part of the law that it, while it has a punitive uh, angle, it also has a, a sort of redressal angle, saying that if you can meet these, these parameters, you might get off with a lighter sentence. And to my mind, that's something that our anti-bribery law doesn't have. Actually, I think they're trying to do it in the latest uh, amendment, but it's a useful thing to have because end of the day, why do you have these laws? You, you want to enhance the level of Compliance. Compliance and enhance the level of governance. You, know, because you can't do away with crimes, but you're at least trying to make the ecosystem such that uh, you know people realize that uh, uh, it's, it's, it, there will be a, a, a repercussion. So that's over the XCPA is concerned. But as you know, coming to these acts of uh, my perspective is that you know to, nowadays we at least what we have seen a lot of these uh, complaints are coming in. See, if a complaint is detected by the management. Action taken is a much more easier, it's uh, quicker. And, but when you get a, for example, you get an anonymous complaint about an um, employee whom you think is extremely trustworthy, absolutely fantastic record, it's a bit of a dilemma at that time because you know, as every company you want to trust your employees first. But you received an a, 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 a anonymous allegation. Now, you can't have a situation that you say that any anonymous allegation I will just not accept because then that's throwing the meat in the shaft. You do not know what you're missing out. So for example, we try to follow up on everything that we get. But the flip side to that is you have to then maintain a level of confidentiality in the beginning. So the investigation has to either internally or externally be done in such a manner that you don't allow the employee to know. Because apart from the fact that you don't know whether he's guilty or not guilty, the demotiv demotivation factor is also pretty strong. So this is the kind of balance that you have to keep when you do look at these uh, uh, you know, these white collar crimes which happen within an organization. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I've answered the question, but... I, I think you certainly touched upon one of the answers to the question, and I'll ask Vyapak to jump in over here, and after which I'll move to Tanaya. Because Vyapak mentioned, uh, you know, the police investigation and uh, like Syria <laughs> is not something that uh, one should, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it, but I think uh, a lot depends on the materiality, the kind of offense that has been committed, and uh, what you're looking for in terms of uh, redress. Oh, absolutely. So, Vyapak, your thoughts on how to address this? Yeah, I think uh, what happens, at least the way we have seen, right, uh, as even Ashok was mentioning, when the anonymous complaint comes or information comes by one um, more to other, at that point in time, you one don't know the extent and the gravity of the complaint. Uh, you also don't know who all are involved. So, I think the first question comes is, who should even know about it, right? Uh, because anybody around you can be involved. So we have seen uh, a lot of times uh, the corporates and the legal teams actually coming to us and saying, who should we even involve and who should we keep you know, people out? Uh, just because somebody is a senior management doesn't mean he or she is not involved uh, in this issue and uh, what is the length and breadth of uh, the issue. Uh, is there an independent audit committee or a compliance team which is outside the legal <coughs> to look into this because then their only motivating factor is to do compliance and not legal uh, uh, compliance so to say, right? They are there to comply with the uh, 
policy to investigate rather than what is so there can be a conflict at the legal cell itself uh, because they may like he was saying we may not want to take it too far right otherwise there will be a disclosure statutory auditor coming this question asked that question asked we don't know so keep it little low right i think that's where a lot of complications and confusion start so from a key factors uh, from a determining a little strategy i think uh, one immediately one has to and not every complaint needs to uh, come to the same conclusion but i think looking at the complaint i think the compliance team or the legal team first has to establish whether this can be even done internally from an independence perspective from privilege perspective because whatever you do otherwise you are actually giving it on a platter to a regulator tomorrow because everything is internal you have prepared a report if sebi comes rbi comes sfio comes and say whether you did any investigation yes give the report there is no question you can say no to a regulator at that point in time so i think the first question to be answered is whether you want to involve external uh, teams uh, to even look into those aspects to start with second as part of the internal organization who should be involved uh, because you don't know where all the length and breadth of the complaint is right uh, again i'm not su- suggesting every complaint is a big complaint or it can be a you know completely rubbish as well so but that evaluation has to be done rather than thinking that okay start with an assumption that there is nothing real about this complaint right i think lot of people start with that notion that okay somebody must be you know disgruntled employee some wrong issues somebody wants to take a revenge there is that internal issues and let's not get into it or senior management will anyways not like about all this let's keep it aside right there can be different reasons to do that but i think the evaluation has to be done third if any external agencies like kpmg or others have to be involved then who is going to hire them and you know whether you are able to uh, put a privilege there uh, i don't know uh, you have a point but uh, i think uh, on the privilege side you need to be very very careful how you hire external agencies third data privacy and how are you collecting the data for your investigation i think it's getting very very complicated uh, and maybe some of you can chip in on that uh, with all the byod policies and people becoming more and more over about their own personal data versus professional data where that information can be used not used uh, are you inviting a counter suit in that sense uh, by not doing the right way of data collection uh, and data storing uh, to that extent uh, so that is uh, possibly the other one and the fourth one is we'll discuss it as we go along but if when sail was saying that you will have to still keep in mind that either you or the other side or the employee involved uh, can, there can be a litigation right or you might have to report it to police or you might have to report it to sfi so how are you dealing with the evidence gathering uh, part of it and how are you going to use it because if you don't gather it in the right manner uh, then that evidence is of no value so i think these are the four or five pointers which i feel uh, people miss out in the hurry of doing one way or the other at the start of the investigation thank you vipak and tanaya you had some thoughts on this yeah so i think first and foremost is clearly um, you know defining how does or what constitutes the investigation team purely depends on the scope nature of allegations uh, vipak actually don't on that privilege very clearly if we are interested in invoking privilege external law lawyer has to be involved depending on the nature of allegations probably forensic investigators auditors and other third party stakeholders needs to be involved but i would like to share some interesting tidbits also on whistleblower complaints my experience suggests 
that 70% of whistleblower complaints are substantiated. No one makes a complaint on a whistleblower channel just like that, <coughs> right? And 70% is a good enough number for an organization to take talk disregarding the motive of why the complainant has lost the complaint. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for an organization to improve. The other aspect of this is really scoping the investigation because, uh, you know, as I think one of the panelists alluded, if we do an investigation and it is found to be substantiated tomorrow and regulator can knock on my door and say, okay, have you done the investigation? If the answer is yes, please share a copy of the investigation. So the scoping of the investigation, what will the investigation team look into? And what is it that they will not look into? I think we do put a lot of focus on inclusion, but clearly also calling out the exclusion. Also during the investigation, sometimes we realize there are ancillary matters, which also probably need to be looked into, but are not part of the allegation. Does the investigation team looks into it? or that information is shared with the internal auditors to take it up separately. I think those are decisions that need to be made so that we are able to protect the interest of the corporation also as well as do justice to the whole thing. Coming to the point, who needs to be involved? First of all, no business leader, no management team needs to be involved when an allegation is coming into the whistleblower channel. It should remain with the investigation team and at max the legal or the compliance team who can kind of facilitate in terms of how the investigation goes around. The, the flip side or probably the positive side to this is because if you as a policy define that no management team needs to be informed, then the question is if the allegation involves a management team, they will not be able to figure it out. Because the policy says you are never informed. You are only informed when the investigation is concluded and depending on what the corporation organizational justice structure looks like, there is always a committee to review that report and determine the disciplinary action. So one good way is never ever have this practice in your organizations where say there is a heads up to the MD that a fresh allegation is coming. No need because tomorrow you might be facing a situation where the MD is actually implicated in that uh, allegation and so it becomes a very very uh, embarrassing situation is you are giving him some insights but not all insights and, and that creates problem. So it probably is a good governance practice is never to kind of let them know. Uh, involvement I think people talked about depending on the severity involvement has to be there. Also not involving the management teams keeps the bias out of it. Because we may have a very good high performer but it is also equally true that the allegation is something which has been substantiated. So in order to kind of keep the bias out, it's best to leave it to the investigators. They are experts, they know their job, and they know how to maintain the independence and keep the uh, objectivity of the whole thing in place. So that's what probably I would say, and as, as uh, the last part of it is clearly is where we draw the line. I think that's very important because sometimes we are swayed by it. We just keep on unraveling more and more issues. I think it's very, very important to the, draw the line to say, this is the allegation, this is what we look into as an investigation team. And there are inputs that can be given to legal, that can be given to internal audit and other <coughs> stakeholders to dive deeper. Sorry. So, Thank you for that. Um, I think we, we've heard a lot of different perspectives. Now, I think what we've all understood is that the starting point of most internal investigations is usually a whistleblower complaint. It can start in different places, but that's usually the starting point of it. Now, how companies deal with whistleblowing complaints has also changed over the years. Uh, initially, there was a, a trend where it would be swept under the rug. Today, things are very, very different. Uh, the law has also prescribed a certain set of uh, 
requirements. So some companies have to have a visual mechanism in place. And more importantly, uh, some obligations have been cast on a statutory auditor on how whistleblowing complaint to check on how whistleblowing complaints have been dealt with. And for that, I'll jump to Jag and say, Jag, what are your thoughts on how a company needs to look at whistleblowing complaints and what's an auditor's role in this? Sure, sure. Thanks, Sahil. <coughs> so again, I'm in an uh, important point. The views are personal. Of course. Uh, and nothing said can be taken as, you know, uh, attributed to my organization. Sorry, just to clarify, Chatham House rules, everything <laughs> that happens in here stays in here and uh, the yeah. views are extremely personal. Yeah. So. Now, see, uh, uh, or obligation on auditors to deal with whistleblower complaints slash investigation. So, I think uh, to, to uh, summarize a couple of important points, one is back in the, uh, you know, Companies Act itself, there was a requirement under, <clears throat> I mean, it's uh, typically called Section 143.12 to report certain acts to the central government. So, there is a form, ADT4 form which requires, you know, the uh, certain acts to be reported to the central government, then it is channelized either to the ROC office or it is channelized to the SFIO depending on <coughs> various factors, right? <coughs> so, uh, now in what cases are those reports made? Usually there is then a guidance note by the ICA, uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants, to say that uh, if it is an auditor identified fraud, Mostly it is an auditor identified fraud and the company has not taken sufficient investigative steps, then you go and report. And that I think also goes back that, you know, if there is a whistleblower complaint that has been investigated either ways, not reported to the auditor, auditor then in their own procedures, not out of the voluntary disclosure by, you know, management, but through other indirect means. Uh, they come across the fact that there was this complaint and there was some amount of fraud was substantiated, it can fall into the auditor identified category. So which means that most likely then it will become why it should not be reported. Right? So because they will feel as if this was being hidden from them. So I think one, we don't want to fall in that category. That So it is better that it, it is kept as management identified. So anything that is whistleblower, uh, fraud, oh sorry, whistleblower uh, reported complaint and then investigated, uh, etc., and reported to auditor will be a management identified fraud. Okay. So, I think that is the first provision. Right? Then, more recently, uh, in the uh, you know, company's uh, auditor's report order, uh, which is effective from the most uh, recent financial year, uh, 1st April 21 to 31 March 22, there is a positive uh, statement that auditors have to give on the uh, on the whole process of vigilance mechanism, ethics uh, hotline, uh, any complaints that have come in. So rather than only looking at the material bigger complaints, now they have to look at whether the process is adequate. And that process is from you know all the receipt of complaints like whistleblower whether they are anonymous or you know uh, or they are named complaints to their screening to their investigation to their closure so is that process good enough or is it not good enough so there has to be a positive uh, opinion by auditors on that and that is why they, they will ask you a lot more questions that you know what have you done about that so granted that you know, they are themselves put under some kind of, uh, you know, obligations, professional and statutory obligations to make those inquiries and then form a view on the whole vigilance mechanism and the complaints handling mechanism. So those are the auditors, uh, just a very broad summary of that. So thank you for that. Uh, I think with that, what we will now do is, uh, a lot of people are asking for it. So we'll take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, people can grab a quick tea or coffee and then we'll assemble back over here uh, to continue with a few more uh, interesting questions. Uh, we will now do a deep dive into uh, privacy concerns and uh, some other aspects of internal investigations, including the regulatory aspect. Please In grab some tea time if there are any We are around for any questions, questions or, or uh, pressing input. issues.